So today, we're moving to energy. And today is energy, tomorrow is water. And frankly, a lot of these are left out of chef discussions because, you know, we, we tend to think about, um, you know, as chefs, we, we tend to think about food and we tend to think about you know, the sustainability regarding food. But we can never forget that energy and water are integral into the production of food and frankly, the running of our kitchens. Now, what's really different about these next two days is that while food is super nuanced and, you know, we kind of got into that, you know, what's right, what's wrong, how do you, you know, et cetera. In the world of energy, in the world of water, it's much more black and white. It's much more cut and dry. There are very good ways of doing things and there are very bad ways of doing things. And the nice thing is we also had discussions about, well, what about, you know, the bottom line? Does it cost more to, to, to be sustainable from a food standpoint? Um, when we're talking about energy and water, we're talking about ways to conserve both of these precious resources, which basically is all about the bottom line. It's about saving money. So what's good for the planet is good for business. So today we're essentially going to get into, we're gonna look at a number of things. We're gonna look at, first of all, the, the global energy basics, um, you know, to kind of look at what's happening around the world with energy. And the reality is that many times we sort of take energy for granted. It's there, it's part of our daily lives, and we don't really think about it so much. But the reality is that without energy, commercial kitchens, they don't, they don't function. Uh, in, our, in our profession, we are tied to energy use. We use it every day in the cooking that we do. And learning how to cook with energy smartly, uh, again, is a great sustainable practice, and it's also great business. It's absolutely a win-win. So let's go ahead and start looking at where we are from a standpoint globally in terms of energy. Now remember, let's, let's put this all into the context of the fact that the population is, is growing. So this slide is really just to show you what types of energy uh, we're using globally. And what you will notice, of course, is how all of those lines are increasing. So you'll notice that we are, which would sort of make sense, demanding more and more energy as we have more and more people on this planet. But also remember, going back to day one, it's also about more and more people who are demanding more and more resources. And those resources use energy more. One of the big and important themes of today is that energy, is a precious resource. And a lot of what we're looking at here are non-renewables, which we're gonna talk about. They, 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 don't, they don't come back. Once we use them up, uh, we have used them up. Now, the other thing that we don't see on this, on this chart is the disparity around the world in terms of who's using that energy. And uh, if you remember going back to the first day's presentation and that one slide of the four planet Earths, uh, the reality is, is that uh, energy consumption around the world is not even country by country. There are countries like those of us here in the United States that use way more energy than other countries per capita. And that also is very much of a problem. So I mentioned that there are uh, effectively two types of energy um, in the world. There's non-renewable and there are renewable sources. So non-renewable are effectively um, sources that are not renewable. Once we use them, they're gone, they're finite. And those are some of the sort of more, you know, things we hear about, you know, oil, we, we natural gas, coal. Those are things that once we've used them, they're gone. And then we have the renewables and renewables are the energy sources that we can replenish. Those are things like wind power, solar power, ocean currents, et cetera, that, uh, you know, thermal, um, oh shoot, what's that? Anyways, you know, these are the things that we can use, um, you know, forever effectively. And there's a lot of movement towards trying to use more renewable sources, but still, as you saw from the previous graph, it's still just a very small piece of, of what, we, uh, what we use. Now, the other thing to remember here, and again, everything is connected. 
uh, energy and global warming uh, are linked. The production of energy also contributes to global warming. So when we see that more energy is being demanded, we also know that that is contributing increasingly to global warming, which then of course destabilizes the environment, makes food harder to grow, acidifies the ocean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So everything is connected. Um, and just to give you an idea here, uh, in the year 2018, emissions from the production of energy hit an all-time high of 1.7% increase in one year globally. And that's a huge increase in just one year. And 30% of those emissions came from uh, the use of coal as a, as a source of energy. The projected growth of how much emissions uh, because of energy that we're gonna add year over year is 0.6%, which is projected until the year 2050, every year increasing that much. Now, what's interesting about that, if you go back to the first day, is that we talked about how do we, for instance, produce more food without using more land, without using more energy, without using you know, more water, and of course, at the same time, trying to reduce global warming. So this trend is absolutely uh, contrary to that. And it really is uh, a problem because it will contribute to some of the larger issues that we've seen. Now, the other thing is that, you know, as, and this is this last little point here on this slide, as the non-renewable sources start to become uh, used up, um, what will happen is that population increases, more demand, and the price of energy will increase, which by the way, in a long-term perspective, will greatly affect the food service industry, which is why we need to be aware of it. So energy and food are, are linked together. Uh, the point you know, of the previous slide was to demonstrate that energy is finite. Uh, we don't, you know, we can't produce it forever from many of the non-renewable sources. It's precious. But one of the dangers in studying sustainability is to see that you know, each part of sustainability is a separate entity. And the reality is that it's all interconnected. You need energy to grow food and you need energy to transport it. And the reality is, is that energy is also linked up, you know, the cost of energy is linked up with food prices. Because in today's industrial food world, um, to be able to produce food as it is being produced in many countries, it's very much energy intensive. There's a lot of energy that goes into the production of fertilizers, how food is grown, and of course, how food is transported. The more specialized the food industry becomes, the more food has to be trans uh, transported, larger differences. It's energy intensive all around. Um, so interestingly, there's a little statistic at the bottom here, which is food uses about 30% of global energy. That's, that's a pretty uh, amazing figure. And I'm gonna throw an even more amazing one at you tomorrow when we look at agriculture and water use. But the reality is, once again, that agriculture is a big consumer of energy. So that's a little bit of the, of the global picture of where we are with energy. There's a lot more we could say, but what I want to do is kind of transition relatively quickly into our world of food service, because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, remember that, you know, in that sustainability equation, which we talked about food, energy, water, and waste, you know, energy is a very, very big part of it. And it's important in the food business. And we have a very special responsibility because, well, we use a lot of energy. Now, this is uh, kind of just an interesting way to look at how much energy is actually used per square foot in restaurants compared to other businesses. Uh, we use a tremendous amount of energy. And this, you know, this particular table is from California in the US, but it's a table that is, is very much common in, you know, around the world. And, and if you think about this for a minute, it's not hard to understand because if you look around your kitchen at how much energy is being consumed by all the different pieces of equipment, we, are, we use a lot of energy. Therefore, we have a very uh, important responsibility to being really smart about how we use energy and food service. So 
where do we use it? So, you know, this is, you know, look around your kitchen. We use energy to cook. We use energy to keep food hot. We use energy to keep food cold. We use energy to wash, whether it's, you know, our pots and pans or our plates, our glasses. Uh, we use uh, energy, of course, not directly, but to grow the food, to transport the food to us. We use energy to light, to provide ventilation, to make ice, and the list goes on and on. And by the way, what, you know, just as, you know, my, my father is a physicist, so I have to put a definition of energy in here. And energy is the ability to do work. Basically, what that means is that energy makes work possible. And if you were to think for a minute, what happens if you didn't have that energy? Well, you can't cook food. You can't keep food cold. And our world changes dramatically. So where do we use energy in the food service world? Um, this is a, a pretty interesting uh, pie chart uh, to take a look at, you know, how does this, how, how, how does it break down? You know, where are we, where are we using, you know, so sanitation refers to, you know, anything to do with, with washing. Uh, the food prep basic cooking uh, appliances, that's, you know, pretty obvious. That's how we cook stuff. Uh, all the other food prep category there, which is 13%, that's, uh, you know, things like mixers, blenders, food processors, uh, toasters, you know, hot holding cabinets, et cetera. Uh, building HVAC refers to air conditioning, heating. Uh, kitchen exhaust, we're going to talk about that a bunch. That's a big energy consumer in our kitchens. And it's not necessarily just the air that we're pulling out of our kitchens, but as, in, as is good you know, air handling practice, you also bring air back in. And in certain parts of the world, if you don't you know, cool or heat the air coming back in, that's a problem. So it, it takes a lot of energy. And of course, there's refrigeration as well. And the refrigeration, 6% there also includes um, freezers. So let's get down to what we can do. So we know that we consume a lot of energy. And we just saw sort of where the different categories of energy consumption are in kitchens. So now we're going to think about, okay, how do we actually save energy? And remember, it's always about also saving money. This is such a win-win for every restaurant out there. The problem is, is that a lot of times what happens is, is it, you know, we, we, we're, we're busy, we go about our, our worlds every day, and we, we don't stop to look at the little things in our kitchens, or sometimes big things, that are wasting large amounts of energy. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, you know, how do we, you know, conserve energy in the kitchen? Well, frankly, we use less energy. We make really good choices about the energy consumption uh, that we do, and we analyze every part of the kitchen. And this is a really important part. Again, we're busy, and so we're going to talk about how do you actually do this so that it becomes a priority in your, in your kitchen? Because if it's not a priority, it doesn't happen. And if we do it right, we minimize expense, we do good for the planet, and we maximize profit. Now, the areas that we're gonna look at specifically in the subsequent slides are ventilation, lighting, sanitation, refrigeration, cooking, um, and, and behavior, which is a really, really huge one. So let's go ahead and begin. So now we're talking about the nitty gritty. Now we're into you know, what we do in our kitchens every day. And, and the first sort of big theme here is uh, proper maintenance. You know, proper equipment maintenance is basically it's how do we use energy and water uh, smartly. Now we're going to talk about water tomorrow, and a lot of the things that we talk about today has relevance when we talk about water as well. But we're going to, as you'll see in the in the next bunch of slides, this idea of maintenance comes up often. And again, what happens far too often is that the maintenance in kitchens kind of gets pushed back because we're too busy. And one of the things that has to happen here is that we have to prioritize maintenance, which means you have to put it on your schedule to inspect the kitchen at regular intervals and also have it very clear as to whose responsibility it is to inspect the kitchens and to be sure that, that the maintenance is being done properly. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about 
some of the specifics. Now we get into ventilation. Now, ventilation is, is in every kitchen. We have to pull hot air or grease-laden air out of our kitchens. That's just one of the realities of cooking today in a commercial kitchen. And yet at the same time as we saw on that pie chart much earlier on, is there's smart ways, or excuse me, that ventilation require, it takes about 11% of the energy. And it's very interesting because um, what I've seen in many kitchens is a lot of times there's very easy things that can be done to greatly reduce the amount of ventilation that's needed. Uh, you can see one of the things right here, which is the cooking equipment, absolutely when it is pushed up against the wall versus if it's out a little bit from the wall, the ventilation doesn't work as well and it requires more energy. Or putting in a very simple side panel like you see in the picture reduces the amount of ventilation that's needed substantially. Uh, also, by the way, just having a stove against a wall versus, for instance, cooking islands where it's open on all four sides, the energy consumption needed to ventilate an island versus a stove that's pushed against the wall is 50% more ventilation that's needed, 50% more. So for those of you who are thinking about you know, making changes to your kitchen maybe or designing kitchens, um, absolutely think about the energy use. And that's by the way, just as a parenthesis, you know, a lot of times when people design kitchens, they look at kitchens from the standpoint of efficiency. They look at standpoint, you know, of a kitchen of how well things flow, et cetera, et cetera. But somewhere on that checklist, when you're designing your kitchens, you have to also have that box that says, have I considered the sustainability implications? Have I thought about how much energy I'm going to need in the kitchen to do what I want to do? Or is there a smarter way to do it? because in the long run, it saves tremendous amounts of money. And just one other comment before I move on to the next slide. And that is that traditional ventilation is, uh, is, is basically a flawed design. And what that is, and we've all seen it in kitchens and it exists today in many kitchens, which is there's an on and off switch. You turn the ventilation on, you turn the ventilation off. And many times I've seen that one switch will turn on large amounts of ventilation at once. Both of those, if you're designing a kitchen or making changes, you should strive to change that. And in other words, it's much better to have multiple switches turn on smaller pieces of ventilation so you don't have to turn everything on or off. And in today's technological world, there are great ventilation systems out there that are uh, what are called variable speed. And in other words, it's not a question of on or off, it's a question of how much you need at any given point in time. And some of them are completely automated, computer controlled. And it, at the end of the day, what that means is that the computer knows exactly how much ventilation is needed at any given point in time and will provide only the amount of ventilation needed versus on, you know, 100% on or 100% off. So lighting, lighting um, is a great example of, of long-term thinking. If you remember back in the first presentation, I said, you know, one of the big takeaways of sustainability is we, we have to think about the long-term impacts of our decisions versus the immediacy or short-term impacts of our decisions. And when it comes to lighting, uh, when it comes to what lights we have or we use in our, in our establishments, this is one of the ones where that applies. And that is the, the, the introduction of LED lighting, which, you know, when we started looking at LEDs, the, the cost was extremely high. Uh, and a lot of people were, didn't want to do it because it, it represented a big expense. Well, thankfully, LED lights, the costs have come down quite a bit. But there, you know, today, there's absolutely no reason not to be putting LED lights everywhere. Um, the, the, the progress has been made and, and, you know, in terms of, you know, proper temperatures of the lights and their effect, all of that is amazing. Now, one of the beautiful things about LEDs is that not only do, does it consume a very, very small amount of energy, uh, but they last a long time. So you actually get an increase in terms of your labor savings because you're not changing light bulbs all the time. And just as a parenthesis, if you've ever cooked under a hood, you know, cooking at the stove, where you have LED lights installed, uh, the quality and brightness of the light is, is, is absolutely incredible. 
Also to give you an idea of what happens when we go from various light technologies to others, for instance, if you have an old style uh, incandescent light bulb, you know, the ones we all grew up with, and you have a 60 watt light bulb, you can replace that 60 watt light bulb with a compact, compact fluorescent bulb or a CFL, for, which will only consume 13 to 15 watts. Or you can install an LED light, which only consumes 10 watts or sometimes even less and gives you the same amount of light. It's an absolute, I mean, this is the absolute win-win. So other things we can do with lighting, um, install motion sensors. Uh, and again, a lot of people are doing this, uh, but if you haven't, this is something to definitely think about. Those areas that are used less often. You know, how many times have you, you know, opened up a closet and somebody left the light on? That is essentially using energy to perform no relevant task. So absolutely put in motion sensors in areas where, uh, you know, and these are basically switches. When somebody opens up the door to the closet, light comes on. They close the door, light goes off. Uh, same with bathrooms. Um, install timers and outdoor lighting. Uh, I love the photo that I took to the left over here of a parking lot. And you can see that is a very large uh, light bulb up there. <laughs> it's producing a lot of light. And of course, it's on in the middle of the day. So uh, installing timers on outdoor lighting will save vast amounts of money. And then lastly, you know, windows. Windows is the old fashioned solution. Uh, it is amazing when you put windows in kitchens, not only is it good for, uh, for the employees, but it also allows you to cut down substantially on the amount of light and energy that you need. So sanitation. Uh, sanitation, again, refers to anything that we're using to clean. And cleaning requires a bunch of energy, absolutely, uh, because we have to get to you know, high temperatures, uh, et cetera. So you know, what are the things that we can do? Uh, and, and by the way, I hope you, you take this presentation and take it back to your restaurant, uh, back to your hotel, back to your kitchen, and kind of go through that and say, wow, you know, what about this? What about that? What about this? And start to implement these things. Because some require bigger decisions, and some require much smaller decisions, and they're really easy. For instance, you know, choosing an energy-efficient dishwasher, well, that comes down to when it's time to buy or, or maybe lease a new dishwasher. The, the, the um, progress that's been made in, in technology of dishwashers is absolutely incredible. And we'll talk about this tomorrow also in terms of water usage, but the energy efficiency of newer models is absolutely uh, incredible. They, again, they may cost a little more, but in the end, you will save a lot of money. Uh, now, little things you can do. For instance, you know, every time you, you, you put a dish in the dish rack, excuse me, a dish, uh, a dish rack in the dish machine and you run a cycle, that requires energy. And how many times have you seen somebody putting a, a rack into the dish machine and it's only halfway full or maybe a third full? You know, that goes down to training that, you know, you wait until the rack is full of whatever and then run it through. Uh, also, you can insulate hot water pipes. This is such a simple thing to do, and it's very inexpensive. And the savings are substantial. You can see a picture of that over uh, to the right on your screen. Uh, they're just foam pieces that you, that you put around the, the hot water pipes, and it, and it keeps the water hot, so you're not losing energy through the pipes. Um, on dishwashers, uh, you many times have those, those curtains that hang down. Uh, those plastic curtains, many times they get damaged. When that happens, uh, you're losing energy, you're losing heat. So fix the curtains, that goes down to maintenance. Um, you know, hot water leaks, absolutely. And also uh, increasing, you know, in terms of, you know, technology, and that's something I keep saying over and over again. In the world of sustainability, when we talk about, uh, you know, we talked on technology a little bit in the previous days, but it's really apparent in, in water and energy uh, utilization. A lot has happened. So if you're looking at replacing a hot water heater, by all means, look into the most energy efficient hot water heaters that are out there. Again, they will save you a lot of money and of course, energy. So then we get into refrigeration and freezing. And, and the, 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 the really big one here is maintenance. Uh, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. I, have cooked in many, many kitchens around the world. And it is, it is always amazing to me how, uh, how often 
um, the maintenance on the refrigeration and freezing is, is not really up to where it should be. And basically what that means is you're just, you're just losing money constantly because what happens is, is that the refrigerator or the freezer is working far too hard. And it, by the way, will also burn it out sooner, which costs you money, but it's working to effectively refrigerate the whole kitchen, let's say. Uh, that obviously is not a good use of, of your energy or of money. So some of the things that we can do, uh, replace gaskets. You'll see the gasket at the bottom left there. How many times have you opened up a cooler door and you see the gasket is a little bit ripped or damaged? When that happens, effectively, that refrigerator is trying to cool the entire kitchen. Uh, we have at the top left, you'll see that there are the, um, the plastic strips there that, that, that make the air curtain at the entrance of a, a walk-in refrigerator or walk-in freezer. A lot of times that those, those plastic pieces get damaged. And so it doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. Uh, what it's supposed to do is when you open up the door, it still provides a barrier so that the cold air doesn't escape uh, into, into the kitchen. But if those are damaged, it's not doing its job. Uh, of course, the, the coils that you see on the bottom uh, middle left there, uh, if the coils are are dirty, uh, the, the refrigerator is not working at, at peak efficiency, and you're wasting energy. And that's just a quick vacuum uh, there. And then the other one that I see often is that cooler doors are not perfectly aligned, so that they don't shut quite right. There's a corner that's kind of open, or maybe if it's an automatic closing refrigerator, then it doesn't firmly seal completely. Again, these are things that, that should be on your maintenance schedule to be sure that that, you know, you know, kitchens are, are busy places, stuff happens, things, gets da things get damaged, it will happen. It's just a question of catching it at the right time so you can make the repairs. So cooking and hot holding, um, there's some really inter interesting statistics here. And a lot of people don't necessarily think about this, but I was, I was so surprised when I learned about the statistic that gas stoves, that gas flame is only around 30% efficient. And in other words, around 70% of the heat that's generated by the flame is actually going up and around the pot and into the ventilation, which means you're spending money on ventilation and you're not really getting efficiency in terms of the heat transfer into whatever it is you're cooking. Uh, induction, on the other hand, is exceptionally efficient, uh, 90%. Now, you might say, well, why doesn't everybody switch to induction? They will <laughs> someday. Uh, the problem right now is that uh, the cost of, of gas tends to be very low, and, and induction um, units are still relatively expensive. But as time goes on, I would expect to see that change um, more and more. Um, and induction is truly, truly the way to go. Uh, in, in, in the future. Um, other things that are, you know, we, we should think about is, you know, for instance, the, the old style, you know, what we call in France, the, the piano, that big, that big metal piece that we heat up and then we cook on it, uh, is a very, very inefficient way of cooking because uh, you, it takes a while to get it hot and then it stays hot all day long if there's pots on it or not, or if there's only two pots on it versus five or six pots on it. Uh, it's a very inefficient way to cook, and we have to rethink this as we're redesigning our, our kitchens. Uh, maintenance is another big piece as well here. You know, we saw the gaskets in the previous um, slide in terms of refrigeration, but that goes in the other direction as well, which is what about the gaskets on the hot holding equipment, on those, on those heating cabinets? Uh, what about the gaskets on steamers? Uh, if those gaskets are damaged, and they do become damaged over time, it's, it's really important to replace them quickly because, again, if the gasket is damaged, you are just trying to heat up or cook effectively uh, the environment in the kitchen, and it's very, very inefficient. And then lastly, uh, you know, to look at the gas flames and be sure that if you're using gas, that the gas is regulated so that it is uh, achieving maximum efficiency. All this stuff really comes down uh, to maintenance, to proper maintenance, to making sure that somebody is looking at it with, at, on, a, on a regular basis. So this is the one where things, uh, it comes down to, to you. It comes down to the individual. 
in the previous slides, there were issues of maintenance and there were issues of purchasing, which we're gonna look at in a minute. Now, obviously, you know, you can't redesign your kitchen every day. Uh, obviously, you can't just pull out stoves and put in stoves, that, 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 that doesn't happen. Uh, but we can change how we behave. And many times changing behavior can give you huge savings in energy and of course in money. So what are some of the things that we can do, each one of us individually starting today? Uh, number one, don't prop open refrigerator and freezer doors. Uh, I've seen this happen when people are doing deliveries and they you know, prop open the door and that door stays open for 30 minutes, 25 minutes. The amount of energy that's being wasted is, is unbelievable. So we really have to think about, you know, maybe what you do is you bring in the delivery, you stack it next to the cooler, and then you kind of open it, have a, have a couple people there, and you get everything in quickly, uh, maybe through the use of a pallet jack or, or a, a two-wheel hand truck, whatever, to move stuff in and out of the refrigerators, in, in and out of the freezers as quickly as possible. Uh, turning on equipment before needed. This is something that when I started in this business, uh, we were we were kind of taught, you know, you, you, you come in first thing in the morning and the first thing you do is you turn everything on. You know, you turn on the stoves, you get the oven, not the stoves, but you turn on the ovens so that they're good and hot. And, you know, then of course you, you know, you turn on the ventilation system because now the kitchen's heating up. Uh, and then you would go sit down and have a cup of coffee uh, and you'd plan out your day. And, you know, the, the reality is with today's technology, you know, it, it doesn't take an hour for an oven to heat up. It takes like 20 minutes. And if you're using combis, it's almost instantaneous. Uh, so be absolutely sure that you're not turning on equipment before it's actually needed. That is a huge uh, waste of energy. And conversely, be sure we're turning equipment off at the right time. Uh, how many times I have seen in restaurants, you know, you, you serve lunch and then you serve dinner. But then in between, there's prep time. And that prep time may not necessarily need the same equipment that you are using during the lunch or the dinner service. Uh, do you need your deep fryer to be on or if it's on to be hot the whole time? Maybe you can turn it down. Maybe you can turn ovens off. Uh, maybe if you're using those flat tops, you can turn it off in between services. Uh, I can give you so many examples of walking into kitchens. I think of one in particular here in the United States in a city. It was a, they, they do a lot of banquets in this city and walking into a kitchen, which was kind of a banquet kitchen. And I was the only person in there for an hour. And I was a, a guest of the place. And I, and I was amazed that there was a, a, a large grill that was on full blast. And there was a, a two full-size combi ovens that were on, you know, producing steam, the whole thing. And I kept thinking that somebody was going to walk in any minute and start cooking because, you know, that's why they were there. After an hour, I went to find the chef and I said, chef, is somebody going to come and use this equipment? And he's like, yo, no, we should probably turn that off. And I, the amount of energy that was wasted. It's about changing behavior so often. Um, following the regular maintenance schedules, you know, this is, this is an issue of behavior. So it's important to create a maintenance schedule. Who does what? You know, put it on paper. Who looks at, you know, the, the, the gaskets in the refrigerator, the cooler doors? You know, who's looking at this? Who's looking at that? And then actually following it up and making sure that it's being done. Uh, it's important to have power up and power down schedules. We are humans. Uh, we forget things. Um, we are not perfect. But if we have stuff written down that this is, you know, every day at this time, this is when we turn these things on. Be sure that these things get turned off at this point. Be sure that before you leave your shift or your, or your kitchen that these things are, are turned off, et cetera, et cetera. And this can pertain to everything, you know, which lights are left on, which lights must be turned off, et cetera. Um, to take the time to look at the uh, at refrigerator coils and be sure there's nothing obstructing them because they need to have free airflow around them. A lot of times kitchens are busy, they're crowded, stuff gets maybe put there, stacked there, and all of a sudden the refrigerator is not working at peak efficiency. And of course, turning lights off. You know, if, if your kitchen doesn't have um, the, the, the motion sensors 
uh, motion sensor switches, then you know how can you train your staff? Well, you know when you're in the storeroom and you leave the storeroom and nobody else is in there, turn the lights off because there's no reason to have the lights on. It's about behavior. And when we change behaviors, and we're gonna, by the way, we're gonna look at this in the next two days because behavior is an important part of water and behavior is a really important part of waste as well. And that comes down to me and you every day in our kitchens. So purchasing decisions, this is, this is for the time now, you know, when you actually get that opportunity to buy something new. Um, and unfortunately, what happens many times is that when people buy things, they kind of look at, oh, what's, the, what's the least expensive piece of equipment I can buy? The reality is that it's very important to look at what the energy utilization of the pieces of equipment will be over time. And you will see many times that if you spend more money in the beginning, that over the life of that piece of equipment, you will save uh, large amounts of money. There we go. And then this, I'm, I'm just going to wrap up on this slide. And it's a little bit just bringing us back to how integral energy is in everything that we do in the kitchen. So this is just a, a quick little thing, you know, that we put together and it's just a, a story, you know. And so let's just go through this very quickly and say, you know, where are all the energy inputs? Can we find them all? So George is gonna make a fish sandwich. Um, he goes to the refrigerator, refrigerators take energy, uh, and he takes out two fillets of fish. Now energy is needed to bring that fish to the restaurant, to catch the fish, to freeze it, to process it, et cetera, um, that have been properly stored on ice. Energy is needed to make the ice. He breads and deep fries the fish, energy is required to bring those, you know, to produce those, uh, those ingredients, to bring them to the restaurant, to store them, and of course, to run the fryer. He then washes his hands in hot water. Energy is required to make the hot water. Meanwhile, he removes uh, the French fries from the freezer. Energy is required for the freezer, and of course, for the French fries. And he deep fries them back to the fryer again. Uh, he takes a bun that was delivered uh, by a truck earlier that morning, so energy to make the bun, to grow the food for it, and of course, to transport it. Uh, and then of course, maybe the energy to store it, you know, the, the room that it's in, maybe it has to be heated or air conditioned uh, from a local bakery and places it in the oven briefly to warm it. Ah, energy is needed for our oven. He then assembles the sandwich and places it on a clean, warm plate. So clean plate required for the, for the dishwasher, warm plate, uh, the plate warmer perhaps uh, needs energy to keep those plates warm. Alongside the sandwich, he arranges some peeled tomato slices. So energy is needed to boil the water, blanch the tomatoes and ice to shock them. And a cabbage salad, again, the energy needed to grow it, transport it. That was earlier shredded using a mechanical shredder. Energy needed to run the shredder. Once he is done, he properly cleans and sanitizes the work surfaces and all the equipment he used. Energy is required to heat the water and even provide the water pressure to the sinks. So energy is used everywhere in our food service world. We cannot exist without it. And energy is a very precious resource. And we have to treat it that way. Much like when we talked about in the early presentations, like, you know, the fishermen believed they could never fish out the oceans. You know, we always believed that there would just be food for enough, you know, plenty of food for the world's population. Well, energy, we're in the same situation. Energy is a precious resource. And every, term, every time we turn something on, we turn a light on, we are using energy and we have to be very, very cognizant of how we're using it. And of course, remember, energy is easy. If we save, if, if we save energy, if we're, if we're, if we're conscious, conscientious about how we use energy, we save money for our food service establishments. And that is a good deal all around. So with that, I wanna thank you for being with me today. Uh, we have two more days to go. I can't believe this is going so quickly. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I wanna thank everybody who's been with me on this journey so far. Uh, stick around because water is gonna be really interesting. And waste is something that is getting so much global attention right now and justifiably so. And we'll talk about that. So I wanna thank everybody. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.